Welcome and thank you for joining us for our November special presentation, Black Bears in the Methow Valley. For those of you who don't know, my name is Daniel Center and I am the Community Conservation Coordinator for the Methow Conservancy. I would just like to start out this evening with a land acknowledgement. I would like to acknowledge that the Methow Conservancy as a land trust and environmental education organization seeks to protect and steward the land that for literally thousands of years was cared for by members of the Methow tribe. This is their homeland. We recognize we must do more to build better relationships and acknowledge our past with our Methow tribe descendants who still live and care for the land in this valley. Now, if you live or spend time in the Methow Valley, you probably have been fortunate enough to see a black bear or two. We are lucky to share this place with a healthy black bear population that we will hear more about shortly. Um, but before we do, if folks could raise your Zoom hand if you've had a garbage can raided or seen a garbage can in your neighborhood raided by a black bear looking for an easy meal. I'm seeing lots of hands here. Yeah, it looks like uh, quite a few of us have seen or experienced our own can getting raided by a black bear. Um, I know this summer, uh, this happened a lot in many of the neighborhoods in the upper Medhow Valley. Uh, Casey Bruchard, who owns our local util utility, Wastewise Methow, mentioned to me this summer that he usually sees fewer bears getting into trash during July and August because bears are at higher elevation. But this summer's fire, with this summer's fires, more bears were hanging down in the lower valley and thus getting into trash all summer long. So with more fires, warmer falls, and more development in the wildland urban interface, our black bear human problems are on a course to get bigger unless we do something about it. So thankfully, we live in a proactive community. And last year, a coalition between Wastewise Methow, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, private partners, defenders of wildlife, and the Methow Conservancy uh, formed out of a shared recognition of this growing human bear conflict in the Methow Valley and a desire to do something about it. This collaboration is called the Methow Bear Aware Project, and it is working on transitioning key areas in the Methow Valley to bear-proof trash cans and working on creating educational opportunities aimed at fostering a long-term bear-friendly community. These efforts have already supported the purchase of 25 bear resistant trash cans that are currently out in the wild and doing good work, but they are not enough to solve the problem. That is why this spring we started a fundraising campaign to raise $15,000 in order to purchase 50 more bear proof trash cans and make all of us more bear aware. Thanks to this awesome community, we are thrilled to have raised just over half of our overall goal and we are hoping to reach our target by next spring so those additional cans can be in place before the bears wake up. Proceeds from this event are going towards supporting this campaign. And so thank you all for being a part of the early success of this project. But if you or someone you know would like to know more about the project or discuss opportunities to provide additional financial support towards meeting our goals, please feel free to contact me anytime at daniel at medhowconservancy.org. As someone who grew up in Alaska around bears and who has parents who live in Montana and routinely experience bear-human conflicts around trash, I am personally invested in doing all that I can to support our community in being proactive in minimizing these encounters, which almost always end badly for bears. So thank you so much for sharing this interest. But tonight isn't all about the problems that black bears cause. It's really about how amazing these animals are. My hope is by the end of tonight, we will all have a new appreciation for the intelligence and diversity found within this species. So to show how special they are, we have with us here tonight, 
two seasoned wildlife professionals who have spent a lot of time observing and thinking about bears. First, we'll hear from WDFW district biologist, Scott Ficken, who will claw into bear biology and behavior. And then we'll hear from wildlife biologist, photographer, and educator, Dave Moskowitz, who will walk us through black bear tracks and sign. So without further ado, let's give a warm welcome to Sc Scott Ficken. Welcome, Scott. Thanks, Daniel. You, I guess, get the award for the bear pun there in the intro. Um, so yeah, as Daniel mentioned, you know, this is a fundraising event that's going to provide funds to deal with some bear conflict issues, but we didn't want this talk to be about conflict. We wanted it to be about the bears themselves. And so that's what we're going to focus on. And I will share screen now. Everything look good? Yeah. All right, here we go. So we're going to talk about the American black bear, Ursus americanus. And I, I like to think of this critter as like the quintessential American bear. But this was the inspiration for Smokey and Yogi and Gentle Ben, and even, even the teddy bear, you know, owes part of its origin story to the black bear. And this is far and away the, the bear in North America that people see the most often and encounter the most often or have interactions with. As before, I'm having some event. There we go. System's a little slow. So in North America, we actually have three species of bear. We have the polar bear, which is um, essentially a marine mammal found in the Arctic and a few near Arctic regions. And then the grizzly bear, which is at this point um, limited primarily to the northern Rockies, south of the 49th parallel, and then through Western Canada and is abundant up in Alaska. And then last, but certainly not least, we have the ubiquitous black bear. And this, this critter is found from coast to coast here in the US, at least um, in a fragmented sense, and from Mexico all the way up into Canada. All right, so the, the map on the left here is a, essentially a rough map of both historical and present range of black bears in North America. And at first glance, it's a little bit shocking because you see there has been a significant range contraction for this species. But that being said, they are still a very common and widespread critter and far more numerous than the two other cousins that I, I just mentioned. And just to put that in perspective, so polar bears in North America number in the thousands, maybe as many as 10,000, probably less than that. Grizzlies in North America number in the tens of thousands, probably you know, 55,000, give or take, maybe. Black bears, on the other hand, number in the hundreds of thousands in North America, maybe as many as a million animals spread across the continent. So, you know, order of magnitude more than these other critters. And again, for, for another little kind of fun fact you can share with people, there are roughly twice as many American black bears as there are all the other bear species of the world combined. So this, you know, this, this critter is in many ways a conservation success story. And one of the keys to its success has been its adaptability. And I, I like to think of black bears as the ultimate omnivorous generalist. And what I mean by that is they eat a very, uh, you know, wide variety of different plant and animal foods. And they're able to utilize all kinds of habitats. They occur just about everywhere except from like true desert landscapes. I mean, even out into the edge of the shrub step. By and large, though, you find black bears in places that at least have some forest component cover. I mean, they will use openings, but there's usually some tree cover not too far away. So actually, the, the uh, term black bear is rather misleading because black bears aren't always black. In fact, they come in a variety of colors. And you know, if, if you wanna think of it from a human perspective, like us, they can have jet black hair, they can be brunette, they can be ginger, they can be blonde, they can be just about every shade in between too. Unlike us, they never get, seem to get too hung up on skin tone or hair color, um, but they, um, 
to have this wide variety of color. And this, this chart on the left here is just a, a little bit of a breakdown on some of the percentages of the, the color morphs that you might see in various parts of the country. And the take home message from this is in areas where you've got pretty dense forest cover, the bears do tend to be black. But in areas where you have more open habitats, they can, in many cases, the majority of animals will not be black. And so here on the east slope of, of Washington, for instance, what we're calling inland Washington in this graph, the majority of our bears are not black. And in fact, here, here just even just locally in the Metow, I've seen, I think, every color phase just about that exists in black bears with the, possible, with the exception of what we call the glacier bear of Southeast Alaska and perhaps the Kermode bear of the central BC coast. Although I have seen extremely blonde bears here in, in the Metow that are just as light colored as those uh, Kermode bears in British Columbia. Let me give you some examples. So here's some bear pictures. These are all local Metow watershed pictures. These were taken from some cameras we were deploying from, for some link survey work. But all of these color phases, you know, we're, we're local here in the valley from black to black brown to various shades of cinnamon and brown and then a very blonde bear here in the bottom. And what's interesting is you can get cubs of different colors within the same litter as well. So, you know, black bears are just one of their many endearing traits is all the different color phases you get to experience. On the flip side, well, let me show you one more slide here. So this, these are bears. Uh, Tom Bin, you'll appreciate this. This is from some black bear density hair snagging work we did this summer. Here's four different color phases of the bear at the same hair snag. So even, even within just one site, you know, we got this kind of variation in the color phases in our bears. It, um, don't pay attention to the pink hue on that, that picture in the upper right. These are remote cameras that aren't real real high, high quality, so the, the color tone is a little bit off. But the point being, again, lots of different color phases locally. And I, I don't know how many, but every year I get a lot of people that call me and are sure they saw a grizzly bear because it was so blonde. And the, again, the take home message here is color doesn't mean anything when it comes to bear identification. Black bears come in all colors. Let's delve in maybe a little bit more into the ecology of the animal and talk about some of the kind of the vital statistics, so to speak, of these critters. Um, males around here I probably average somewhere between 250 and, or, yeah, 250 to 350 pounds, and females are uh, about 150 to 250, or about a third smaller than the males typically. Now, there are bears that get bigger than that. I've seen a few here locally that were probably in the four to 500 pound range, but generally the the really big black bears occur in areas farther east where you have a lot of mass crops like chestnuts or acorns or a lot, a lot of nut crops where they can really pack on calories. And we'll talk about calories here in a little bit. But another cool thing about bears is they, they routinely live into their 20s and some bears will even live into their 30s in the wild. And that bear in the lower right-hand corner of the screen there, that's a bear in Minnesota. It's the oldest known wild bear to date, and she was 39 and a half years old when she died. So, you know, these are animals that ha can have a pretty long history on the landscape and um, can experience a lot in their lifetimes. Their, their hearing and eyesight, their hearing for sure is better than ours. Their eyesight is probably better than ours, but where they really excel is at their sense of smell. You know, they, their nose is like seven times better than a dog's. And you all know how good, good a nose your dog has. Well, bears, bears put them to shame in terms of their ability to, to detect scent. You know, I mentioned, I kind of glossed over the fact that their eyesight is probably better than ours. It, there's, for a long time, people assumed that bears had a poor sense of eyesight because you know, they use their eyes or their ears and nose so much. But, you know, if you, when you have an encounter with a bear, oftentimes they will hear you first, but then they will stand up and they're standing up to get a better scent of what it is that's approaching them and to get a good look at it. And, it, and what we've discovered is their eyesight's actually pretty good. So um, from a life history perspective, here's kind of a fun little graph that gives you kind of the, the annual cycle for a bear in a nutshell. So bears, you know, <laughs> I guess in many ways you could say they live the life of Riley. They spend like six to eight months eating and then they spend four to six months sleeping. 
that's that's pretty much what a bear does. Now, obviously, there's there's a lot of uh, there's a lot more going on, but that's really the two phases of a bear's life: is eat and then sleep and then do it over again. So, you know, they're coming out of the den, depending on age and sex, somewhere in March or even into April, and then they're going back into the den somewhere in October or November, typically. And while they're in the den, the female's giving birth. We'll talk about that in a little bit here. And then during that summer foraging time, kind of in the middle or maybe the early third of their foraging season is also breeding season. June is really the peak month probably for breeding. So bear comes out of the den, takes a couple of weeks to get the metabolism kind of back up to full speed, but then it's, you know, it's, it's okay, we're in foraging mode from then on. And when they first come out of the den, they're often, you know, there's not a lot available typically, so they're usually eating the, the fresh spring green up, a lot of sedges and grasses, certain flowers, um, equisetum, horse, horsetail, they'll actually eat. So there's a variety of sprouting plants that are bear favorites or at least um, something that they can get some calories out of. The bears in the upper right are actually eating spring beauty flowers up near Mazama. Uh, the one on the left is uh, sedges, and, sedges and grasses actually along the roadway. So that's, that's kind of how they start their feeding season. If they're lucky, they might come across, say, a winter killed deer carcass and get a real calorie boost that, you know, that, they, that they won't always have access to. And then as the season progresses, more calorie, higher calorie foods start to come online. And I would say the first major one in our part of the world is the service berry crop. You know, in a lot of years by June, this crop is coming on pretty strong. And over the years here, um, you know, rarely do we have a bad service berry crop. Uh, there's always usually at least a pretty good, if not very robust service berry crop. So it's, it's pretty, pretty dependable for bears. And it's about the same time around the 1st of June that deer fawns are being born and, and bears will opportunistically uh, take a deer fawn. I, I had one do that near my house once. It, uh, it's quite a traumatic thing to witness, but you know, it's like Discovery Channel in the backyard. Um, along the way throughout their foraging season, they're eating insects whenever and wherever they can get them, including things like tent caterpillars in this slide. But there's a whole host of different bugs that bears will partake in. In fact, Insects typically make up the bulk of the animal matter that black bears consume. Now, like I say, that can vary by individual. You get the occasional individual who's maybe a little better at finding deer fawns in the spring or knows good places to look for a winter kill carcass. But most uh, bears are getting a lot of their animal protein from insects typically. And as bears are cruising around the landscape, you know, they're making seasonal movements. They, they are not territorial in the traditional sense, like say cougars or uh, wolves are. They, um, they have kind of a, you know, a, a home range area that they use annually, but there's a lot of overlap between individual bear home ranges, both between and among sexes. Roughly speaking, um, some of the recent work by some of my colleagues suggests that the average female home range size is around like eight square miles, although that's, that's gonna vary depending on food availability and males somewhere around 35 square miles. And that's, that's, that's like their core home range. Now they will make forays outside of that to take advantage of say uh, a specific seasonally available food source. And the, the graph on the left is an illustration in red of a female home range or movements anyway, and uh, the blue is, is a male. And that, that's uh, in the Lake Wenatchee area, which you know, relatively similar habitat to what we have here. All right, and they, oh, I was gonna tell you a little anecdote. So back in the 90s, we collared some bears here in the valley. I was part of the team that trapped them. There was a researcher looking at a variety of bear ecology questions and we would have bears that we caught in the Chiwak. They would pretty much hang around in the Chiwak most of the season. And then when the huckleberries would ripen up near the crest, this bear would just make a trek all the way up to the, to the Cascade Crest, feed on berries and, and come back. So they, they can make pretty extensive movements if, if they know they've got a food reward at the end. All righty, so I threw this in, this is kind of fun. Um, one kind of interesting dynamic about bears is they're, they're mostly a solitary animal. Other, 
outside of breeding or females with cubs, but they do occasionally run into each other and get together. And there tends to be more social interaction and more, you know, wrestling and play behavior when food is abundant. You know, if bears are getting well fed, there's not as much competition for resources. They're not, you know, they're they're feeling good about the weight they're packing on for the winter hibernation. They just seem more apt to engage in play. And so here's a little local video of a couple of bears having fun. I've got several videos of these two bears uh, with each other and wrestling and playing. And it was interesting to me because one is noticeably smaller than the other. The brown was noticeably smaller. They're both males, but because they're such different sizes, I'm skeptical that they're siblings. I think they're just bears that like each other's company. Anyway, short diversion there, but as we, as we continue through the summer season, as we get into say late season and early fall, or late, late summer and early fall, some really, some really important high calorie foods start to come online. And around here, that's primarily our, our berry crops. So some important ones would be huckleberry there in the upper right, choke cherry in the lower left are two really, really major berry crops. And then there's a variety of what I would call like secondary crops. So things like elderberries there in the lower right, mountain ash berries, uh, black caps, uh, kinnikinick berries. You know, there, there's a laundry list of foods that bears will take advantage of. But um, these berry crops are really important. And, and at this time of year, Late summer, early fall, bears are in what we call a state of hyperphagia. Basically what that means is they're eating all the time. They're, they're spending like 20 hours a day eating, consuming anywhere from 10 to 20,000 calories a day. And so they're, they're trying to pack on that, that poundage right before they head into the den. And in fact, you know, they're they, typically over the course of the summer and fall season, they're gonna gain about a third of their body weight which they will then use up for the most part during hibernation. So you know, it's a really, really important time of year for them, which is why in some cases, and you know, we're not gonna talk a lot about conflict, but it gives you an idea of why conflicts can arise because bears are in this mode of gotta pack on the calories. So after hyperphagia, then bears, once, once the food availability dwindles, then bears head to their dens. And Again, denning can start anywhere from you know, somewhere in October into November. The females with cubs tend to go in first and come out of the den last, and the adult males tend to go in last and come out first in the spring. I don't, I don't entirely understand that. I was thinking about that last night, and I don't know. It's, it's somewhat contradictory to me, but anyway, that's what tends to happen. Based on, and this is anecdotal, so take it with a large grain of salt, but based on some local camera work I've done, it seems like roughly Veterans Day, 10th, 11th of November is when the activity on my cameras really drops off. And so I think most of our bears are in the den by about that time. Now there's exceptions. Last year I had a bear that was out past uh, Thanksgiving, a smaller bear still trying to gain weight. But I think most of them are in the den by then. And they, they use a variety of structures. Trees are actually their most important denning structure. And that can be stumps. It can be a hollow tree that's standing. It can be a tree on the ground with space underneath it or that has a hollow center. This is particularly true on the west side where majority of their dens are in some sort of a tree structure. They also will use a rock den like the one to bear that's tucked back in there on the right, or they will actually dig a den as this bear on the left is done. Uh, let's see. Hibernation. All right. So, I mean, this could be like you know, twenty-minute discussion about hibernation and the ins and outs. But I nutshell version here. There's there's a lot of um, debate about whether bears are true hibernators or not, depending on how you want to define that. And what I mean by that is, you know, bears. Well, what, let, let's compare what a bear does when it hibernates with an Arctic ground squirrel. An Arctic ground squirrel's temperature drops way down to just a little bit above freezing. Their heart virtually stops beating. They have hardly any respiration. You know, they're, they're pretty close to inanimate. A bear, on the other hand, it will, its heart rate will drop fairly noticeably. Its respiration will depress somewhat, but its temperature doesn't really change that much. Only drops by maybe three degrees or so. 
And so, you know, people say, well, they're just kind of in a deep sleep. And that's, that's not really a very accurate assessment of their condition either. I mean, yes, they are much more easily rousable than say a ground squirrel, but they're doing amazing things while they're in what we're gonna call for our purposes, hibernation. They're not eating, they're not drinking, they're not uricate, or urinating and they're not defecating. And, you know, think about that for a second. You know, how can they possibly do that? And they do that by recycling a lot of the waste products that are uh, developed as they're metabolizing their stored body fat. And some really cool things about this process is they don't, they lose much less muscle mass than we would lose if we tried to do the same thing. And their bone density stays basically stable, whereas we would lose a lot of bone mass if we tried to sleep for six months. And this is, you know, in addition to just being super cool, kind of a superpower, I call it, um, it might have applications for space travel, you know, you know, because muscle mass loss and bone loss are big hurdles or obstacles for long, long-term space travel. So we're kind of trying to figure out more how bears pull this off. And then females take it up a notch. I mean, if, if you know, just doing what I told you wasn't enough, on top of that, females are giving birth and nursing while they're in hibernation. So that transitions us into reproduction. Um, moms or females are generally having their first litter at around five years of age. Occasionally, a four-year-old will have a litter. Sometimes they won't have a litter until they're six, seven, or eight, but five is, is typical. Usually, they have two or three cubs. One and one or four are not that uncommon either. Um, so, you know, variety in the number of cubs kind of depends on the mom's uh, state of health and her age to some degree, which leads me into a discussion of kind of what I call another superpower of bears, and that's, that's delayed implantation. And what that means is, so we talked about the bears typically breed in June. So bear get, mom gets bred in June, um, embryo gets fertilized, but it doesn't implant in the uterine wall and start to develop. It just floats around, it free floats, until about the time mom goes into the den. And if she's put on enough fat and weight, it implants and starts to develop or, or the multiple embryos implant and start to develop. If she's thin, she may just reabsorb that embryo. And so it, you know, it's another amazing adaptation to an animal that lives in a place that has a seasonal food shortage. And the cubs will stay with mom for about a year and a half, give or take a month or two. So after their second, you know, they're born in the den the first winter, they spend the next winter with mom. And then that following June, when she gets bred again, that's when they tend to separate. So the picture there in the upper right is uh, what I'm pretty sure is a yearling cub near my house in June of 2020. You know, that's so just for sort of reference, that's about what a yearling looks like. And the photo on the bottom is a mom with a yearling again, uh, grazing in the spring up near Mazama. Um, oh, and sometimes even though the yearlings will separate from, or bears will separate from mom when, when they're a yearling, if, they're, if, they, if there's more than one, the siblings will often stay together for a year or two or three after that until they begin to breed on their own. So, you know, we've talked a little bit about some of the cool things bears do, and, and, but just under the broader category of behavior, um, bears are just super charismatic and fascinating critters. It's, uh, there's, it's thought by many that they, they rank third on the intelligence list among, uh, in, in, the, in the mammal, uh, among mammals behind primates and cetaceans. Bears come in at number three. And Part of being smart like that is that you typically don't have a lot of instinctual behavior. Instead, most of what, you know, most of your behavior is learned. And in this case, it's learned from their mom. The males don't really have any role in rearing cubs. In fact, the moms tend to avoid large males uh, fairly, um, they, they make a, a lot of effort to avoid large, large males. So mom's the, mom's the caregiver, mom's the teacher, and these little guys, pretty much learn everything they need to know to survive out there from mom. And so that's why, you know, they're staying with mom for a year and a half. They've got a lot of, a lot of learning, a lot of food gathering information, a lot of um, learning where on the landscape they can find food that, that they've got to absorb. 
And one thing that's kind of cool about bears is they, they can do what we call single trial learning. You know, in many cases, it only takes one experience for a bear to learn something important. And generally, that's a good thing. You know, that means that um, mom shows them where there's a rich berry patch, and they know that for next season. On the flip side, sometimes, you know, that, that works against them. And that, that's why avoiding, um, trying to avoid any, any situations where bears have access to human food is so important because as single trial learners, it only takes one experience getting bird seed to, to learn, hey, you know, these big wooden boxes have little wooden boxes hung outside that have really good food in them, you know, and so they get bird seed at one person's house and then they're on to the next house looking for their next handout. So that's why, you know, we, we, we've got the Met How Bear Aware project going and while, while we're trying, why we're trying to teach people, you know, what they can do to minimize the chances of this kind of thing happening. Uh, let's see, how am I doing for time? I'm probably just about done, which is good because we're down to the last slide here. Um, I, I'm gonna be honest, bears are probably my favorite critter on the planet, whether it's grizzly bears or black bears. You know, there's a variety of other critters that are a close second, but I love bears. And I think, I think they might be the ultimate watchable wildlife critter. I mean, people make treks to Yellowstone Park, for instance, specifically to see bears. And they're just, they're just so enjoyable because they're so smart and they have such complex behavior. And one of my favorite things is a behavior that we call tree rubbing, where you know, bears have these, these rub trees. We could talk for 20 minutes probably about why and, and what and how, but it doesn't matter. It's just fun to watch. So I've got, I've got like probably hundreds of these videos. And if, if I'm having a bad day and I put one of these on, it is guaranteed to improve my mood. I, I tell people, okay, if you watch one of these videos and you don't at least smile, you probably have issues that require professional help. You know? Their bears are just really charismatic. And so, you know, I hope you enjoyed that. And um, I will look forward to answering any questions at the end. But at this stage, you know, we're going to um, switch it over to David, who's going to tell you now that I told you how fun bears are to see, you know, how you can go out and maybe look for bears or at least find their sign. Great. Awesome. All right. Well, let me just share my screen. Let's see if this works. Um, how does that look? Good. All right. Well, let's just start right off where uh, Scott left off. Just thanks for that, Scott. I actually, I learned quite a bit from that. And uh, um, yeah, I really appreciate that perspective and wealth of knowledge and experience with bears in the valley. It's really cool to see. And I would agree that um, one of the things I was just going to start with is that we are so lucky to have these animals on the landscape. And and I love watching bears and seeing how bears interact with the world and just really lucky to have this large carnivore on the landscape that's really watchable. And most of our other large carnivores um, don't do things like that. You know, we don't get the chance to see them like that. And uh, they're just such cool animals. So, and very curious about the world. That's one of the other things that I've really appreciated about bears is that in the same way that I'm investigating them and their tracks and signs in the world and their behavior, you can tell bears are doing the same thing in reverse, that they're investigating us. And, and uh, you wonder, is it, um, you know, who's in the zoo when we're sitting in our house and they're outside of it, like wondering what's going on inside there. It's, it's kind of an interesting thing to think about. But <clears throat> um, yeah, I just want to talk a little bit about um, how to know if we found bear tracks and some of the interesting signs they leave on the landscape, because although bears are relatively observable, uh, they're even, there's way more sign of them on the landscape than actually them. So for every time I've seen a bear, there's probably hundreds of times that I've seen tracks and signs they've left behind. So uh, learning to identify that and interpret those signs is another way that we can just appreciate this really magnificent animal that's sharing the world 
with us. So I want to start with just footprints and just as a wildlife tracker, you're always interested in, in animals' feet um, because that's you know what they leave tracks with. But beyond that, these feet also tell you a lot about how they interact with the world as well. So that's the front claws and hind claws of a black bear. And um, you see those really curved claws, similar in size in the front and hind foot. They, uh, they look pretty vicious there. Um, they're also pretty closely related in terms of if you look at them, a squirrel has a similar shaped claw and a raccoon has a similar shaped claw. These claws are really good for climbing actually. So as opposed to like grizzly bears that have flat claws, which are good for digging. Um, I think these claws demonstrate one of the, uh, you know, adaptations of black bears, which is their ability to climb trees for food and refuge. We'll talk a little bit about that, but um, just kind of an interesting feature on their feet. There's the front foot of a bear and the hind foot of a bear here. So similar in size, front and hind feet, and generally similar in shape with five toes and an arc. And then this kind of um, crescent shaped palm pad, the heel of the front foot's quite a bit different than the heel of the hind foot. So when you think about that human shaped foot, that's the hind foot that you'll often see. Although sometimes just the uh, front part of the uh, hind foot shows up. So then you get a very similar front and hind track. But uh, here's a classic presentation of bear tracks. I'm sure most folks that have lived in the valley at some point have seen black bear tracks. Uh, and that's a six inch scale there. So, you know, about the size of, you know, a human foot, so to speak, roughly speaking. But the key feature that I always look for in black bear tracks is that palm pad. They walk really heavy on that palm pad. So Sometimes the toes don't show up uh, real clearly, but that palm pad often will. And one thing you'll notice in this set of tracks is despite those big claws, they're not showing up here. So a lack of claws is not something to be concerned about in terms of a bear. It's not that it's been declawed or doesn't have claws or, you know, some people might think it's a, a mountain lion because it doesn't have claws, but a lot of times bears claws just don't show up in their tracks for, for whatever reason. So. Um, don't be surprised about that. When bears move throughout the through the landscape, and for those of you that have seen bears, you know they typically walk. If a bear is doing anything other than a walk, something interesting is happening uh, because they don't run from place to place, right? They might run away from something or they might run at or towards something. They might run a little bit if they're playing, but for the most part, 99% of the time, if a bear is walking, if a bear is moving across the landscape, it's walking in kind of a lumbering gait. And it leaves a pattern where the hind foot on one side of the body actually goes a little past the front foot. So in this slide, you can see a right hind foot and then a right, oh, excuse me, right front foot, then a right hind foot, then a left front foot and a left hind foot. Um, here's a, that same pattern in the snow. And you can just see it's kind of this ambling pattern, just, just a, the same way a bear moves, the track pattern resembles that, just kind of walking, ambling through the landscape, lots of tracks kind of close together. So here's another look at that really classic pattern for a, a bear moving through the landscape. And you can see in this too, just look at those really deep palm pads. That's a, a feature um, that really stands out to me. Sometimes that's all that's left after the tracks start to age is that kind of kidney bean shape uh, palm pad. Here's a little comparison. Uh, if, if I was doing this in person, I'd ask you guys to tell me what you think this is, but uh, I won't ask you guys to do that. Uh, but this is not a bear. This is, a, uh, this is the tracks of a wolf. And uh, so just for comparison, similar in size, but you can see a very different structure to the animal's feet there. So less toes registering, but more importantly, the shape, like the orientation of those toes is very different rather than that even arc of toes in a bear. These are kind of two ranked in a much smaller palm pad. If you go back to the bear tracks, you can see that the palm pad is the widest part of the track. It's just as wide as the toes. And then if you go to this uh, wolf track, you can see the palm pad is much smaller than the, uh, than the width of the toes when you put those all together. Here's another one for a uh, comparison. So, uh, this one's another animal that we might confuse them with. I mentioned this is a mountain lion. And uh, once again, you can see mountain lions 
have a smaller palm pad relative to the size of their toes. Those toes are the widest part of the track. Um, and those toes tend to be, again, more two ranked. So rather than an even arc to toes, you can see there's like back toes and front toes. Uh, sometimes a mountain lion will step one foot on top of the other, but not completely. So you'll get what looks like a five-toed track. And I've had people send me photographs of what looks like a five-toed animal thinking it's a bear or a wolverine, uh, but it's a, it's a mountain lion that's indirectly stepped on its own track. So you just got to look for that carefully. In that instance, that might be one way that people confuse these with a black bear. So those are their most common lookalikes in the, uh, in the valley here. And I do also want to put in a plug for uh, just making sure that those of us that are feel comfortable identifying bear tracks are also good at at least the basics for sorting out grizzly bears from black bears. Because this is a, a common question that we have and here in the North Cascades, we're always on our keeping our eyes out for grizzly bears. And on this chart on the left side is a uh, black bear tracks on the right side is grizzly bears. The first thing to say is that um, probably the worst clue to use is the size of the tracks. So black bears come in all sizes, grizzly bears come in all sizes, while the largest grizzly bears are bigger than any black bear. That's just a very small portion of the grizzly bears on the landscape. So most of the time, grizzly bears and black bears, there's a pretty good chance their the size will overlap. So that's not a good clue. Uh, one thing to look at is that arc of the toes. So you can see in uh, black bears, it's a stronger arc to those toes as opposed to in your grizzly bears, those toes are more even, like almost in a straight line. Um, and then another feature to look at is if the claws are registering, if you've got one track that's got super long claws and another track that's got you know claws that are much shorter than that, that's a good clue you might have a grizzly bear as opposed to in black bears where their front and hind claws are similar in length. So another feature you could look at. And there's a few other things as well there, but uh, just a, a few things for you to pay, pay attention to um, if you're trying to sort out what type of bear you have. So um, that's a little bit about tracks. I want to talk about some other signs that you could see on the landscape with bears. And um, I put this one up because you'll see that this bear has grass in its mouth. And um, one of the things that Scott mentioned is that uh, bears eat a lot of plant matter of various types, and that will show up in their scats as well, which I'll talk about in a minute. So I don't want to pass up on the fact that bears eat a lot of plant matter. And, and like I said, we'll look at some scats that show that. But I also wanted to um, point out one particular type of sign that you're going to find on the landscape that's often quite surprising to people, which is fairly common here in the Metau Valley. This is a white bark pine up in the sawtooths. And you can see the bark's been removed from the base of this tree. There's a closer up view of it. And you can see how it's been pulled off in big shreds. So this is one of the more interesting behaviors of bears here in the Pacific Northwest. And as far as I know, uh, this is the really the only place that black bears are consistently doing this. They're actually feeding on the cambium of the tree, kind of like a beaver does. And they'll pull off that outer bark. And then you can see these scrape marks going up the, the tree on the tree, that's actually right here. You can see it beautifully. That's their incisors on their lower jaw. So they'll rip off the outer bark and then they'll scrape off the cambium with their front teeth of their lower jaw and, uh, and feed on that, that food source, mostly in the spring. Uh, so that's a really interesting sign to keep your, your eyes out for. Here's another one. This is a cottonwood uh, that was feeding on and you can see those marks on it. This sign will stay on the trees forever. Like those, as long as that tree is around, uh, this scar will last. And so it's a very long lasting and fairly common sign you'll find on primarily conifer trees um, here in the North Cascades. So I thought that was kind of just something for you to keep your eyes out for. Um, here's a uh, classic bear scat that's filled with grass. And one thing that I'll often tell people, one way you know you found a bear scat uh, as opposed to say a horse or an elk or something else is that with a bear scat, 
you will know what that animal was eating because the, it comes out looking roughly like it went going in. And bears have a digestive system built for meat. It's very short. And uh, so things don't get, plant matter doesn't get digested very well as opposed to things like deer and elk that have a very powerful digestive system for plant materials. So if you can identify the specific species of plant the animal was eating in their scat, there's a pretty good chance that it's a bear. And if it looks like nothing but just vegetative fibers, totally unrecognizable, there's a pretty good chance it was not a bear. So um, the next few slides, uh, Scott actually shared with me from his probably massive collection of, of scat photos of bears. And just to give you some variety. So generally the shape is the same as in uh, the, the grass scat before, but this one you can see there's actually, uh, this is fur in here and uh, some of the um, hoofs of a fawn. So this is from them eating meat and fawns in particular. Uh, of course, berries, this is the classic one. You might be able to identify specifically what type of berry the uh, animal was eating. And I always wonder like how much, how many more berries do you need to eat to get enough calories when you're not even digesting completely everything you're eating? So that's, that's kind of an interesting one. This one I believe is apples, another classic sign to see here in the Meadow in the fall. And uh, this one that Scott shared with me is my personal favorite, uh, which um, includes fish bones. So obviously quite a common um, you know, thing that we think about bears eating fish. But if you look even closer here, you can see there's a fish hook as well. So um, hopefully that didn't bother the bear's digestive system too much. But, uh, uh, and I'm sure that there's stories behind all those scats, which you're gonna have to ask Scott about if you wanna know anything more than that. Um, I've unfortunately also found scats that were completely filled with garbage for bears, uh, plastic bags and you know whatever else it came across. So um, one other just thing to, Note, this is a wolf scat, so interesting for comparison. Uh, mountain lion scats are similarly very tubular like this. So um, just by comparison, as opposed to those bigger kind of blockier pieces of scat in a mountain lion. But if you look closely at this wolf scat, look at this claw right here. You see that? Take a closer look. Do those claws look familiar to you? Yeah, these are black bear claws in a wolf scat. And so that's another important thing for you to realize with black bears, they're big and gnarly looking, but they are not the top of the food chain around here. Um, and I found a few instances of <coughs> wolves in particular uh, that have, have been consuming black bears. In other places, wolves specifically hunting black bears has been documented. Um, these, I don't know if it was hunting black bears or just scavenging on a dead bear, but uh, they're both sides of the food chain for sure. Uh, the next sign that I want to key you guys into to pay attention to is uh, in this photo. And this is a, you can see there's a wetland down here and a riparian edge. And to me, when I'm thinking about bears, this tree right here in the middle, that big ponderosa pine stands out. Black bears love big trees on the landscape. If there's a really big tree, especially by a wetland, go straight there and I bet you'll find bear sign. And one of the signs that you often find under these big trees is a bed. This is actually up in uh, the Libby Creek watershed and there's this remnant giant um, Douglas fir in the forest there. And we went to the base of it and you can see this depression under here. And there was a bear bed under there. Why? Bears like these big trees to bed under. I've heard some people think they feel safe under it because they'll, they can escape by climbing up the tree for refuge. Um, but for whatever reason, big trees on the landscape, bears have a strong affinity for it. This is another bear bed under a clump of big trees on the edge of a wetland. And you can, this is really common for a well-used bear bed. You can see this matted down area and then it's just surrounded by scats. So bears will poop wherever they are in the landscape. They're walking down the road, they'll poop there. They're sleeping, they need to go. That's where they'll leave their scats. They don't place them on the landscape strategically like other carnivores. Um, so if they're using a bed for a long time, you'll see lots of scats like that. And here's another little close up. It's just like a packed down, just kind of roundish, uh, maybe a little oval depression at the base of a tree and then a scat close by 
Um, it's, a, it's a sign if you know what to look for, you can find them on the landscape and something kind of a unique window into the lives of bears. Another sign that uh, you guys are maybe familiar with is this, um, these marks on the tree. And uh, of course, um, many of us maybe have seen bears climb trees and these signs can be uh, last on the landscape. Those were quite obvious, but if you look, this is the uh, beaver um, pond trail at Sun Mountain. Um, and gosh, I haven't been up there since the fires. I don't know what it looks like now, but last fall it looked like this. And if you look at these trees, um, you can see that, see these slash marks right here? These are old bear climbing marks. And if you look right here, you see these dots. We'll just take a closer look at these. You see these dots right here? Those are the imprints of the hind feet of a climbing bear. And then if you look right here, here's some fresher marks of a bear as well. So these trees have been climbed repeatedly by bears. Um, bears will climb trees for two reasons. One is to find things to eat and the other is for refuge. And I have heard, although I haven't witnessed that um, uh, bears will climb aspen trees to get catkins in the spring from the tree. I don't know, I, you know, I haven't seen it, but I've heard that. Um, they clearly climb a fair number of aspens because you'll see that quite commonly and you'll see a patch of trees where many of the trees have been climbed, um, but they could also be climbing them for refuge. Here's a, here's a black bear in a tree for refuge and I, it was scared of me. It got freaked out when I came into this grove of trees and it climbed up into a tree for safety, which is a great defense mechanism against um, wolves. Uh, because that's the primary thing that would scare them. Wolves or grizzly bears, neither of which are strong or can climb trees. Uh, so that would be a safety mechanism for them for those two other large carnivores. Um, and then uh, the next sign that I want to point out that you guys have all seen a lot of, but probably missed, uh, or maybe you haven't sometimes, but it's very common along hiking trails. So this is a, a hiking trail on the Pasadena. And we're going to take a close look at this tree, which is right along the edge of the hiking trail there. And you can see at head height for us and for a standing bear, there's a chunk of the tree that's been removed, right? And remember those uh, rub trees that we saw the great video of, of Scott? Here's a, here's a bear doing a similar behavior, but you can see in this particular instance, if it's using a fence post, same behavior against trees, but you can see how it's reaching back behind it and it's biting. And so when bears bite like this, uh, sometimes they'll remove a chunk of wood and bark and it'll leave this really distinctive pattern on the tree. Here's another example, um, again, head height. And if we take a closer look, you'll just see this rectangular chunk of wood removed from the tree. And you will literally find this everywhere all over the Natal Valley, wherever bears walk down old roads or logging roads or trails, just keep your eyes out for these little blazes on the trees and uh, rectangular chunks of bark removed. Here's another old road and you can see some claw marks from the marking and a chunk of wood removed. Here's another one, again, head height, uh, old logging road, chunk of wood removed. That's what it looks like as a close up. Um, here's another one. I like to call this one a, a bear sign. And, uh, and this bear was coming out and marking on this uh, forest service sign. And it's literally at some point, this sign is gonna fall over because of how much wood they've taken out of that, um, that tree, or in this case, a fence post. And a lot of times these, um, they're marking on what appear to be uh, prominent trees. If you go back and look at this, it's like the one tree hanging out over the, over the um, trail and, um, when you're leaving messages for other members of your you know, species, you wanna leave it someplace where they're not gonna miss it. So prominent features on the landscape, such as this, hard to miss, are probably make good um, you know, places to think about putting up signposts. And the other thing I'll say is they're not only rubbing and biting these um, trees, but then they come back, some of them won't mark on them, they'll just smell them. And so this is messaging, you know, again, as Scott mentioned, you could talk all about it, but these are, message boards between the bears uh, communicating with each other about all sorts of interesting things, I'm sure that we don't understand. Perhaps their observations about humans in their little boxes in the valley, amongst other things. 
So that's a, a bit of a whirlwind tour of uh, bear uh, tracks and signs. And I'll just wrap up. This was a, with this photo I got of a um, black bear uh, up off the loop a few years ago. And um, I like this photo in part because this bear is so expressive. And I know that sometimes we're concerned, you know, some of us are very scared of bears. Some of us love bears. We have a lot of motions about it, but um, one of the things that I really love is as we get to watch bears, we realize that they're very keyed into us and they will interact with us and communicate with us through their bodies. And, um, and, um, and if we just have to pay attention to it, and this bear in particular was communicating to me, not wanting to be aggressive, its body's turned sideways to me. It's looking at me out the corner of my eye. Maybe some of you have heard, you know, about how you're not supposed to stare a bear directly in the eyes or square off to it because they'll find it assertable. Bears will use that same behaviors with us. And more often than not, you'll realize that bears are working pretty hard to, to not be aggressive towards us, but to communicate that they want peaceful coexistence, which I think all of us do as well. So with that, I'll pass the floor back to Daniel. Thanks so much. Scott, Dave, thank you so much for those insightful and entertaining presentations. Um, while folks have a couple minutes here to put their questions for you both into the chat box, um, I'm gonna answer a question that I got during the presentations. Um, and that was a question about uh, who is the fiscal sponsor of the MetHow Bear Aware Project? And that would be the MetHow Conservancy. And so if you are looking to support this project further, um, you can make a direct donation uh, via the MetHow Conservancy webpage, which I put a link in the chat box and you just need to put met how bear aware kind of in the special comments box and that donation will go directly to this project. Um, so yeah, please submit uh, more questions into the chat box. We already got some good ones here. Um, Dave, the first question I wanted to ask was for you. Um, and it's kind of about how when you first come across a set of tracks um, can you walk us through your process for understanding what that bear might be doing um, and how it might be moving through the landscape? Uh, yeah, well, if it's a set of footprints, um, I mean, the first thing that I'm going to use to do interpretation is context. So where you find a set of tracks will tell you a lot about what it's doing and will be the start of the assumptions I might make about that I might test. So for instance, if you find a set of tracks heading into an apple orchard in the fall, I'm gonna start wondering if it wasn't going there to forage. So a lot of track interpretation has to do with putting those tracks in context and thinking about why the animal would be traveling in that place at that particular time. Um, because most animals, um, there's a good reason for what they're doing. Uh, they, they, don't, they don't like to waste a lot of energy. So, um, they're usually tying their behavior to seeking food, seeking a mate, avoiding things that are, you know, scary to them or whatever. So just thinking about every, whenever a bear is doing something, there's a reason for it. And you can start putting the places they are in the landscape into context. As far as other interpretive things, like I mentioned, you know, walking bear, you can generally assume is fairly comfortable on the landscape. Mm -hmm. A running bear is fairly uncomfortable or excited about something. Uh, if you see that. And then um, beyond that, uh, in a lot of ways, tracks are harder to interpret for behavior than other things like scats, which will tell you what the animal was eating. Uh, and all these marking signs will tell you not just that a bear has been in the area, but that that's a resident animal uh, and things like that. So there's some things that come up at the top of my head. Great. Yeah, that was super useful. Um, and kind of just a follow up question to that. Do you have like any favorite environments or times of year or context um, in which you go looking for bear tracks or sign? Uh, for, I'd love to hear what Scott has to say about this. But for me, the spring is like they just come out. They're super active. You can often see them out feeding in open areas. So they're easier to watch. And they do a lot more of that marking behavior mm -hmm. in the spring and early summer. Like there's a real peak around May-ish, I found. And again, I'd be curious what Scott says. but. Um, that's a really exciting time of year for bear watching and bear sign interpretation. 
I, I would agree with that too. I think early spring or mid spring is a great time because they're they're in more open country doing the grazing that you saw in the photos earlier, and they you know they really don't have access. Well, they could access the higher country, but it's still snowed in, so they have no reason to be up there. So they tend to be a little bit more concentrated in areas that are more accessible. The other time to see bears is in known good berry fields in the late summer, early fall, like the Maple Pass Loop, for instance, before it became you know, before it's crumbling under the weight of the people using it. That, that used to be a great place to go see bears eating berries. It probably still is to some degree. Um, those of you who are familiar with uh, the first pass you get to if you're doing the loop counterclockwise, which was that Heather Pass, I don't remember. Anyway, you get up to that first pass, you look to the north, there's a hillside across the way that has good berry fields on it. I've seen as many as four bears at one time feeding on that hill. So berry, berry fields are your next best bet. Great, yeah, that that is super good to know for folks. And um, we're in the wrong season now, but hopefully you all can hold on to those bits of knowledge for when those seasons arise. Um, okay, switching gears a little bit. Um, I have a question kind of specifically about this time of year, Scott. Um, or Dave, have you guys ever stumbled across a bear uh, lying on or near the surface this time of year or early in their hibernation phase? Yeah, I'll start and then David. Dave's probably got some experience too. So those two cubs I told some of you about at the beginning of this before the talk started, they had made little, little beds, little nests like Dave described at the base of some big pine trees and that's where they were spending their time. It, probably would not have been. They probably would have stayed in those little nests. In some places where winters are milder, for instance, like in Pennsylvania, I've heard stories about bears that then simply by making a nest or a little hollow and a whole bunch of fallen hardwood leaves, and they just spend the whole winter sleeping in that leaf pile. So yeah, sometimes you will find bears that are basically denning on the surface, so to speak. And what should be, um kind of the proper way to react to a bear when you come across it in that state? If the bear doesn't know you're there, then just back away slowly. Chances are, again, given their, their good senses, they may have already picked up on the fact that you're there. I would like talk at it a little bit in a relatively calm voice just to let it know you're a person. And again, back away slowly. Keep your eye on it. I mean, don't turn your back on it completely, but the odds of an, an aggressive bear encounter are really small. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Well, always good to keep your eyes peeled while you're out and about, folks, uh, for bears or other wildlife. Um, got a question here. Um, have either of you seen methow black bears uh, feeding on salmon, either fishing or feeding on dead salmon along the river? My short answer is yes, and I'll let Dave uh, answer if he has a longer answer. No. no? I have, no, yeah, no. I've seen a bear right in town, run across Main Street here in Winthrop, run down to the river right at the outlet of Spring Creek there, grab a spawning salmon, and then run up the other bank into a little bit of cover and start eating it. And I've seen sign of bears eating fish up the Twist River as well. Interesting. Yeah, I would imagine it's a great source of protein if they can get yeah, it. If they can get it, you bet. Yeah. Okay, this uh, question's a little bit specific, uh, but um, I'm going to ask it here. So a bear climbing 50 feet to pull a human out of a tree. Uh, it, the question says true or false, but I'm going to say possible or not. <laughs> <laughs> possible, yes. <laughs> Likely no. Awesome. Thanks. Um, got another question here. Uh, I think, you know, with this last summer fresh on everybody's mind and kind of the fires affecting kind of mid higher elevation areas near the valley. Um, do we know anything about what the effects of fires like those are on bear habitat use, uh, territories, denning. Um, what do we know and what do we don't know? 
Um, you know, we don't know specifics because we're not monitoring, but we, we don't have any bears radio collar, for instance, here in the valley currently. So I can't give you any specific anecdotes. What I would tell you though is, you know, bears have got to keep eating. So if they're if part of their home range turns black, they're going to go elsewhere to look for food. And so they're going to move around in response to the fires, basically, so they can keep foraging. Now that's in contrast, for instance, with the radio collar deer that we had in the fire perimeters this year. They basically didn't move at all. With one exception, there was a deer up on Thompson Ridge when that fire was really raging. She came down Little Bridge Creek, maybe three or four miles, waited two or three days, and then went right back up to where she was, which was now black. Deer just have a really high fidelity to their seasonal uh, mm. home ranges. And bears, on the other hand, typically are going to keep moving around to find food. Okay. Um, and another kind of unique phenomena to this year um, has been kind of our warmer fall with low, like low early snow. Um, do those warmer falls have any effect on bear behavior? Um, yeah, you want to take a crack at that, Dave? You want me, I, mean, I feel like I'm taking all the There you go. This is um, your wheelhouse. This is great. I'm, uh, I'm, I'll, I'm taking notes here. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think they do, to the extent that there's still food available for bears to, to uh, partake, then yeah, they will probably stay up a little longer. But even in, a, even in a mild fall, if the berry crops have pretty much withered or been more or less eaten, they're still probably going to bend, even if the weather is a little bit mild, because there's just nothing left to eat. That being said, oftentimes what will trigger a bear to enter its den that it's probably been preparing for a few weeks is a big weather event, like a major storm. A lot of times you'll see bears go into the den right after or during a big storm. OK. A um, couple other kind of specific bear biology questions here. And then, Dave, I promise I'll get you another question before too long. Um, OK, this question asks, uh, do male and female bears hibernate together or in separate dens? No. Um, and I, I just had the privilege of watching a presentation on bear denning ecology from Rich and Lindsay, our two bear cougar specialists, which was fascinating. We could do a whole presentation on that, which they did. And I'm encouraging them to do that for the conservancy at some point in the future. But the short answer is no. However, they have documented where, say, an adult male bear used a den that an adult female had used the year previously. But they, they don't use them together now. And do individuals have a high fidelity for their past um, denning spots? Great question. And Rich and Lindsay are kind of at the forefront right now in terms of the information we know mm -hmm. about that. And the short answer is they can. So they've documented the same bear using the same den in multiple years. They've documented the bear's offspring using the den that she had previously used. And they've documented completely unrelated bears using another bear's den in a, in a subsequent year. So I guess the, the take home message is if it's a good den, it, it can and probably will get reused by someone at some point. Very interesting. Um, and is the number of cubs a bear has uh, in a year an indication of how healthy uh, their, um, the landscape was the year before? Yeah, I, th I think it is. You know, you know I, I told you about delayed implantation and how the female sort of, sort of subconsciously makes a decision about whether or not to develop those embryos. So if she's had a great year, berry crops were good, she's fat and sassy, yeah, and she's got, say, three or four embryos floating around in there. They're likely all to develop into cubs and, and be born. If, she, if it's lean times, yeah, she may not have any cubs or it might be just one. The other variable there is if it's a young mom, smaller body size, not as much reserve, young moms tend to have fewer cubs in their first couple of years, but then that, you know, that stabilizes after that. Okay. Um, and Dave, over to you. Uh, do both male and female bears both like do they both mark trees? Great, yeah, and I actually be curious to hear what Scott has to say about this from all those cameras he's got out. But um, yes, both males and females will rub trees and mark them, and scratch them, and 
fight them. Um, and I think they'll do it in males. will do it more certain times a year and females will do it more at other times a year. As far as I understand with the big, the males do a lot of it leading up to the breeding season, probably some communicating about with each, with, uh, with other males about their presence and then with females about their presence as well. But I believe both males and females will do that. Um, although males perhaps on the average slightly more than females. I don't know if that's I what you found. I agree with all of that. Yeah, I've had both males and females rub on my rub tree and cubs too. But because I'm most active when the apples are on and there's a lot of bears around, because, they're, because there's a lot of male bears around, the females aren't around much because they're avoiding those big males. So the because I have a preponderance of males rubbing on my tree, but that may just be a function of the fact that there's too many males around for the females to do it much. And I would also add that I believe there's there's been at least one study, if not more, that shows that the more social interaction, like the more dense the bear population is, the more marking you're going to get. Yeah. So um, as a um, as you have more chances of interacting with each other, they're going to do more of that marking behavior to coordinate or avoid each other or message between each other. So, yeah, that's fascinating. Okay, Scott, since you brought it up, um, maybe we can ask a couple questions kind of about like um, bear attractants around the home. Um, and I think you specifically talked about apples and this question asks um, if someone could comment on how to deal with um, bears and fruit trees and are there any reasonable or practical ways uh, to deter, deter them from eating the fruit and potentially hurting the trees? You know, the short answer, your best bet in that situation is an electric fence. That's probably your number one tool. Um, you can get out there and pick the fruit as soon as it's ripe to help try to mitigate that or minimize that. But, you know, as soon as the fruit, I mean, the fruit doesn't even have to be fully ripe and the bears are going to start utilizing it. And if, if they can physically get to that tree, they're going to eat your fruit. So you have to keep them basically off the tree. And they, I mean, they're such good climbers and they're so intelligent. A fence is probably not going to do the trick. I mean, an electric, you know, regular fence, an electric fence is your best bet. Okay. Good to know. Um, and someone else asks, what's, uh, what are the major causes of mortality for bears, uh, including cubs? Well, David touched on this. There are other predators on the landscape who mm -hmm. will occasionally take bears. Uh, wolves in particular, grizzly bears, for instance, if you're talking about black bears, um, you know, mountain lion theoretically probably is not going to take an adult bear in most cases, but cubs certainly. Cubs are pretty vulnerable to a variety of predators. Even something like bobcat or coyote can take a cub. And of interest in uh, Rich and Lindsay's denning talk, what they've discovered with remote cameras is a lot of other carnivores will visit bear dens. Or, or you know, if they, if they sense a bear den, smell it, they will come investigate. They've got mm -hmm. lots of videos of coyotes coming to bear dens, cougars, other bears. And so there may, you know, they, these are carnivores that are maybe opportunistically looking for a chance to grab a cub. So they, they do have predators. Once they're adults, you know, predation on adults is not that common with the possible exception of some specific areas where, as David mentioned, wolves will actually tend to target black bears in some, in some cases. Okay. Wow. That is fascinating. Um, Dave, a question for you here. Um, have you taken any like notable or memorable black bear photos? Um, and if so, like, I don't know, what were those photos and kind of what were the bears doing? And I don't know, is there anything about those photos that stand out to you? Well, the photo of a black bear in my field guide, um, the Wildlife of the Pacific Northwest guide, um, was a, a young male bear that I had was feeding on. Um, huckleberries in the Olympics and I approached it from downwind and was staying a good distance away from me from it you know it's trying to keep a respectful space it didn't know I was there and I was keeping the wind away and doing a great job and then the bear all of a sudden got looked over its shoulder and got really anxious and just and like left and then a mom and a cub came out 
and started feeding in the same area. So the mom had displaced this, you know, younger, smaller bear. And, um, and then I was like, okay, well, I'm watching that, those bears. And then I just got this funny feeling in the back of my, you know, just like, where did that other bear, where did the young bear go? Cause it disappeared. And I look over and the bear is now coming back along the hillside, totally parallel with me. It had dropped a safe distance away from the mom and the cub, which is where it had been. And that safe distance was exactly where I was. <laughs> we had both decided that that was the appropriate distance to stay away from a bear. And, uh, but it was totally looking at the other, the mom and the cub, cause that's what his, his concern was. And um, so I had to finally, at some point decide what to do because I decided I didn't think the bear should like stumble into me, like literally, you know? So at some point I stood up and just started talking to the bear and started trying to back up and that bear and you can see in the photo again it's standing sideways looking at me and it's stuck between me on one side and the mom and the cub on the other side and the mom and the cub are of course watching all this and I snapped a few shots as it was kind of trying to weasel its way literally between mm -hmm. us without getting too close to either of us and then it disappeared into the woods and then I disappeared down the hill and I think the mom and the cub went back to feeding. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. So that's, 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 whenever I see that photo, I always think about that, that moment. I was actually leading a, a backpacking trip for a bunch of teenagers who were all asleep at that point. It was like, first thing, it was like 5 a.m., you know, and I got back to camp and woke them all up and they're like, had no idea. It's like my whole day had, had been, you know, was started and done at that point, really, as far as highlights. And they hadn't even woke up yet, but because that's the story of a lot of teenagers too. But I digress. It's not about bears. No, that's awesome. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to make this the final question. And it's one that I want each of you to answer. Um, if you could know one thing about black bears that we don't currently know, um, what would that be? Hmm. I think about that for a minute. I'm going to let Dave go first, but I saw another question pop up that I'm going to answer real quick. Okay, should go for you, it. Should you carry bear spray? Short answer, yes. Carry bear spray. Very effective. It can, you know, avoid a serious conflict. It also will work on cougars. So short answer, yes, carry bear spray. But and and Scott, it, should it be called bear spray? Oh, I don't know. I don't really, you could call it carnivore spray, I suppose. I mean, shoot, it works on people too. So, but, uh, so I don't care what you call it, but yes, it's worth carrying. I got to think about that black bear question. Dave, you go first. Uh, I think that, I think the thing I'd like people to know is just that bit I mentioned about when that you can read that they're communicating with us. Mm -hmm. Whenever you see a bear, if it sees you, it's sending messages to you and you're sending messages to it through your body language and the tone of your voice. And, and most of the time, like when we see bears and they interact with us, their primary concern is, is to not anger or aggravate us. Sometimes that's not the case. Sometimes, you know, we'll get into standoffs, but uh, just so much of the time, these animals are just trying to live their lives uh, around us and in proximity to us uh, without incurring our wrath. And I, and I think that's just an important reminder for all of us when we see them, we can, we can actually, they're trying to tell us some things, so we should pay attention. That, that's a great answer. I, I think, yeah. I mean, mine's kind of sort of similar. I would love to be able to get in the head of a bear. And I, you know, it's, so it, I, it's something I'm never going to know, but I just feel like there's a lot of times when bears are doing things just because it's fun. And I would love to be able to confirm that. I'm convinced it's true, but, you know, there's a lot of very objective stoic people who you know say you can't read that much into it but the, the thing the uh incident that comes to mind i saw a video one time of a bunch of people at lake tahoe and his families they got their kids they're down on the beach they're playing the waves they're enjoying up walks mama black bear with her two cubs and does exactly the same thing they get up to the edge of the beach and they start playing in the waves just like all the people are doing mm -hmm. it's like it's just because it's fun and you know, mm -hmm. I, I'd love to be able to know how, just have a better idea of how bears perceive the world. Right. Guys, uh, 
somebody just put in the comment that this was the best presentation ever. And I think um, a lot of us would agree with that sentiment. It's been a lot of fun to have you both uh, on the same presentation. So thank you for being so generous with your time and sharing these wonderful stories, photos, uh, and your experiences with us. It's been a treat. So with that, everybody, we'll say good night. Um, and I hope you have great dreams about black bears. See you next time. Good night, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.